Hey guys, it's MJ the Student Actuary and we're going to be talking about Chapter 5 for CT5 and this chapter is called Net Premiums and Reserves. Um, before I get into it, I just want to do a little bit of advertising for a little app I made. Um, very simple, you tap the screen, it generates a number between 1 and 100. If it's any other number, it shows red and if it's green, I mean, sorry, if it's one, it goes green. So lots of fun. It was very few lines of code, but download it, have some fun with it, and let me know if you come up with a cool um, use for it. Anyway, marketing done. Let's get into the theory of actuarial science. So net premiums and reserves. Just a quick little um, intro. These are going to be some of the formulas we're going to be looking at in this video. So, without further ado, let's start with one of the most important formulas or one of the most important concepts in actuarial science, and that is called the principle of equivalence. And this is our basic equation of value. It's saying that the expected uh, present value of premiums is equal to the expected present value of benefits. This is important because it means that if we know the premium, we can calculate the benefit, and if we know the benefit, we can calculate the premium. And it doesn't always have to be in this form, but this is the most common. And what's interesting here is that what this is saying is that the policyholder is engaging in or is giving the, the life insurance company an annuity contract. So the policyholder is promising to pay um, premiums for as long as they are alive um, on a regular basis. The life assurance company, on the other hand, is promising to pay an assurance contract uh, for a value B whenever that life dies. Now what's interesting is it doesn't have to be like this. The, the policyholder could pay a lump sum premium, in which case they'd be paying the AX, the assurance, and in return they could be getting um, an annuity so they could be getting a benefit for as long as they live. And that kind of works with pensions. However, for life assurance, this is the most common, and this is what we're going to be working with. So what is quite nice is premiums are generally equal to the benefit times the assurance contract divided by the annuity contract. Anyway, let's get, into, um, let's get deeper into the theory for this chapter. This, is, this causes quite a few headaches. Um, this is quite, quite a lot of the difficult questions in the exam will feature around this net future loss random variable. And it's defined by the, the letter L, and it is equal to the present value of future benefits minus the present value of future premiums. Now, that doesn't sound so scary, so I've created a little example uh, just to show you what this is going to involve. So let's say we've got a whole life assurance, the sum assured is 50,000, it's payable at the end of the year, and the life is now aged 48, and premiums are paid annually in advance. L is equal to the present value of the future benefits, so 50,000, minus the present value of the future premiums. But now take into consideration that we're using the K48 and not an assurance um, with, instead of X we've got 48. So, as you can see, this is a random variable. So, I must stress this up. This is a random variable where these guys over here are expected values. So, this is important because with a random variable, you can also calculate the variance and you can calculate confidence intervals. And why that value is very important is because the expected value of that random variable is equal to our prospective reserve. Now the prospective reserve mathematically is, let me give it up here, is equal to the expected present value of future outgo minus the expected present value of future income. Now prospective reserves is when you make a reserve based on you looking forward. Whereas this retrospective reserve, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is you look at the past. So prospective reserve, you're looking at future outgo minus future income. 
retrospective reserve, you're looking at the expected accumulated value of past premiums minus the expected accumulated value of past benefits. And that's just a little accumulation function. It's, it's the inverse of what we spoke about in um, chapter four. And these two reserves will be equal if they're calculated using the same assumptions. Now, what exactly are reserves? So that, that should be a question going through your mind is, what exactly are these reserves? And so what I've done is I've drawn two little graphs, okay? So what this graph over here shows is the blue line is our assurance contract. And you can see, as soon as you take it out, this blue value, it's equal to the sum assured times the probability that you die. So the chance of you getting your value in the beginning is very small, whereas you're getting it as time goes on, your chances of dying increase, hence the expected value increases. Whereas the premiums, you're kind of paying the same level premiums month in, month out. So what this does is in the beginning, your premiums are more than the assurance. So we create a surplus. And at the end of the, um, the contract, the assurance is going to be worth or expected to be worth more than the premiums are bringing in. So a deficit is created. So what we do is in the beginning years, we, we basically farm the surplus and we calculate a reserve. And that's essentially what we mean by reserves. So it's money that we're putting aside now to meet future payments. And We've got you. Why do we hold reserves? Well, like I said, with the blue line increasing, expected benefit costs increase over time. Why? Because your chance of dying increases over time. Premiums paid are usually level. However, in practice, to try to make it, because you want to try and match it to the benefit, that's why you'll have your premiums in real life will have escalations and will increase due to inflation, all that. But essentially, when you start an insurance contract, the early premiums are more than enough, but your later premiums are insufficient. So that's why you need to set aside some reserves now to fund the future shortfall. This is quite easy when, when we're looking at life assurance because the expected uh, benefit, you can see, increases with time. Where this gets interesting is when you go into short-term insurance or when you start insuring your car. Because you can't just draw a nice blue line like this because your car value is decreasing and the chance of you having an accident kind of, well, we don't really know. It can either be decreasing or it can be increasing. Decreasing because you're becoming a better driver with time, but increasing because as time goes on, there's more traffic and more cars you could hit into. Which brings me to the second point, which is, we don't even know what the sum assured will be in general assurance because you could just drive into a tree and damage your own car and that's a, a set amount or you could drive into another car and damage that car as well. So general insurance reserves become incredibly difficult and in fact there's an entire subject, I think it's CT7 or CT8, that is just on reserving. So if this does interest you, uh, that is some good news because there is an entire subject on just this reserving. But we are going to get more advanced into reserving when we look at the gross premium. But for now, we're just focusing on the net premium. So the net premium, it doesn't make any allowance for future expenses. And it's your very simp simplistic one. These are some nice formulas to know. Um, what you can do is work out... Um, according to that formula we've shown above, you can simplify it to get these mathematical relations. Then um, there's also the recursive formula. This might explain uh, reserving in a little bit more, more depth. What we're saying here is your current reserve plus um, the next premium times by the interest we receive is equal to um, the reserve for the following year times the probability that the person survived, so you don't have to pay it out, plus the sum assured times the probability that they die. So reserves at time t plus the premiums accumulate with interest are equal to the expected cost of setting up a reserve 
at time t plus 1 plus the expected cost of the death benefit. Now, I have gone very quickly through reserves, um, but it is quite a fundamental um, subject or a core component, as you'll see the later chapters build up on these ideas. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about in this video and for this chapter is something known as death strain at risk. And what death strain at risk is, is essentially what the name says. It is the financial strain that the company will take on um, if you had to die. So for a assurance contract, the death strain is equal to the sum assured less the amount of reserves we've had. So if we're going to pay someone 50000 and we've got 20000 um, reserved for them and they die, then the death strain at risk will be 30000 for that person. When it's an annuity, you can see there is no sum assured. So the death strain at risk is actually a positive amount because it means all the reserves that we, let's say someone buys a um, life annuity, we set up this reserve of say a million um, because they're going to be taking 100,000 every year and we expect them to live for so long. If they suddenly had to die, then all these reserves that we have turn into profit. More correctly, we call it mortality profit. And what that is, it's equal to the expected death strain, and expected death strain is the expected number of deaths times the death strain. Subtract that from the actual death strain, which is the actual number of deaths times death strain at risk. And this is the additional amount of money that we made due to mortality being incorrectly calculated. So it can be a profit and it can even be a loss. So this can be a positive number or it can be a negative number. If you have a very good actuary working for you, then mortality profit should be very close to zero. And it's one of the indications to know how good your whole mortality investigation was. Um, I remember when AIDS hit the market, mortality profit went kind of haywire. So it is a good indication to know how well things are expected to happen. But essentially, yeah, that is um, chapter five, uh, the net premium reserves. So we've looked at death strain at risk. We've looked at the recursive formula. We've looked at the simple formula, uh, if you want to calculate it quickly. We've looked at some graphs just to explain why we need to save up money in the beginning. It's because there's the deficit later on. Um, we've looked at the retrospective reserve formula, which is the accumulations. And we've looked at the prospective um, reserves, which are the future values. And we've, we've just touched on net future loss random variables. Do practice examples because this can get quite difficult. And we looked at the principle of equivalence. And yeah, that is chapter five, net premiums and reserves. And yeah, go download my, my little app. Um, it's called One in a Hundred. So yeah, thanks for watching guys. And I will be uploading chapter six quite soon. So subscribe and give that little like button a uh, a little touch. Thanks guys.